Товарищи, разрешите выразить благодарность от имени нашего съезда всем братским партиям и группам, представители которых почтили наш съезд в своем присутствии. И не которые прислали съезду приветственные обращения. The 19th Congress was held in Moscow from October the 5th to October the 14th, 1952. It elected a new composition of the Central Committee of the Party. In order to understand why history has confirmed exactly the capitulatory, self-liquidating essence of the CPSU, one should turn to a little-known episode from the activities of the Central Committee elected by the 19th Congress. After the Congress, on October the 16th, a plenum of the Central Committee was held. J.V. Stalin spoke at the plenum. His speech was unexpected for the plenum participants, not in the sense that no one expected the party leader to speak at the plenum, but in terms of its content. This speech by J.V. Stalin threw the plenum into a stupor. There were two reasons for this. Firstly, J. V. Stalin directly warned the members of the Central Committee about the readiness to betray the cause of Spravedlivost to bourgeois degeneration and to collusion with imperialism of those whom the crowd considered to be his closest, most faithful companions and, in some cases, his successors. So, J. V. Stalin directly expressed his distrust of V. M. Molotov and A. I. Mikoyan. Secondly, J. V. Stalin told the members of the Central Committee about what they should have guessed themselves, that he was already old and tired, and therefore the time would come fairly soon when he would not be able to lead the party and the state, as a result of which it was necessary to think in order to elect in advance another person to the post of General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Governing Party. This notification of the content of the speech of J. V. Stalin could have been limited and could have proceeded to further consideration of the problematics. But it is better to turn to the testimony of a participant in the plenum, since otherwise our conclusions about the attitude of the participants in the plenum to this episode may seem to some to be groundless slander. The well known, authoritative, and respected writer and poet. K. M. Simonov, became a candidate member of the CPSU Central Committee elected by the 19th Congress. In his memoirs, recorded on a tape recorder in the hospital shortly before his death, deciphered and published under the title, Through the Eyes of a Man of My Generation, After His Passing Away, he, referring to one of his diary entries, reports the following about the plenum on October the 16th, 1952. In the March 1953 record of this plenum, for many reasons, I did not expatiate. But nevertheless, first I will quote, as it is, a brief note from that time, and then, from memory, I will decipher some moments that now, 27 years later, it will probably be less of a sin to decipher than to consign to oblivion. Although, we note, it was a sin to keep silent about this plenum throughout the entire Khrushchev Brezhnev era. Back to the quote. Here is this entry in its original form. Naturally, I have no right to record everything that happened at the plenum of the Central Committee, but without touching on the questions that were raised there, I still want to record some details. Our note. During the years of the existence of the USSR, there was the concept of party secret. Some issues of the life of society and the state were considered at the so-called closed party meetings and sessions of plenums and congresses. Non-party members were not allowed to attend closed meetings, and the materials of closed meetings, plenums and meetings of congresses were not published in the media. Back to the quote. When the plenum began at exactly the appointed moment, everyone was already sitting in their places, and Stalin along with the rest of the members of the Politburo, having come out of the back door, began to approach the presidium table. 
Those gathered in the Sverdlovsk Hall applauded him. Stalin entered with a very professional, serious, concentrated face, and, having quickly glanced around the hall, made a very short but powerful hand gesture from his chest in our direction. And in this gesture it was expressed that he understands our feelings towards himself, and that we must realize that this is a plenum of the Central Committee, where we should get down to business. One of the members of the Central Committee, speaking at the rostrum, said at the conclusion of his speech that he was a devoted disciple of Comrade Stalin. Stalin, listening very attentively to this speech, sitting behind the speakers in the presidium, briefly replied, We are all students of Lenin. We note that this is about the issue of how the personality cult of J.V. Stalin was created over the course of decades. Speaking himself, Stalin, talking of the need for firmness and fearlessness, spoke about Lenin, about the measure of fearlessness displayed by Lenin in 1918, what an incredibly difficult situation was then and how strong the enemies were. And what about Lenin? asks Stalin. And Lenin? Reread what he said and what he wrote then. He thundered then in this incredibly difficult situation. Thundered, was not afraid of anyone. Thundered. Stalin repeated this word twice or thrice, over and over again. Thundered. Our note. J.V. Stalin recalls the time when the conflict, Bolshevism and socialism in one country on the one side, world behind the scenes and world revolution on the other, was the most acute. The situation in 1918 was qualitatively in many respects analogous to the situation in 1952. Back to the quote. Then, in connection with one of the questions that arose at the plenum, it was the question of the removal from J.V. Stalin of part of his official duties. K.M. Simonov reports on this in detail further on. Speaking about his duties, Stalin said, Since I was entrusted with this, then I do it. Not so that it will be written after me that I did it. I was not brought up like that. He pronounced the last part very sharply. What happened, and what was behind this short note I made in 1953? I will try to recall and explain to the best of my understanding. I do not want to take a sin onto my soul and try to restore those details of what happened at the plenum, which I remembered, but at the time, did not write down. I will only speak about what really engraved itself in my memory and remained in it, as a difficult and even tragic reminiscence. It is difficult, we note, to die as a psycho-trotskyist without having fulfilled your duty to the future. The entire plenum lasted, as it seemed to me, a little over two or two hours, of which Stalin's speech took about an hour and a half, and the rest was taken up by the speeches of Molotov and Mikoyan, and the elections of the executive bodies of the Central Committee that ended the plenum. As far as I can remember, while Stalin was speaking, Malenkov led the plenum, the rest of the time Stalin himself. Almost immediately after the beginning, Malenkov gave the floor to Stalin, and he, going around the back of the presidium table, went down to the chair, which stood a few steps below the presidium table, in the center of the rostrum. He spoke from beginning to end, harshly and without humor, no sheets or pieces of paper lay in front of him. Our note. That is, J.V. Stalin found it necessary to speak without a prepared text or at least the theses of his speech, which could have become known in advance to any of his guardians from the staff of the Central Committee apparatus. Back to the quote. And during his speech, he carefully, tenaciously, and somehow heavily peered into the hall, as if trying to penetrate into what these people think, sitting in front of him and behind. The tone of his speech, the way he spoke, his eyes grasping at the hall. All this led everyone sitting into a kind of stupor, 
I experienced a particle of this stupor on myself. The main thing in his speech boiled down to the fact, if not textually, then along the lines of thought, that he was old. The time was approaching when others would have to continue doing what he did, that the situation in the world was difficult, and the struggle against the capitalist camp would be difficult, and that the most dangerous thing in this struggle would be to falter, to be frightened, to retreat, to capitulate. This was the most important thing that he wanted not just to say, but to impress into those present. Our note is that this is a recognition that they understood that Stalin was not a power-hungry person, but was concerned about the continuity of the cause of Bolshevism. Back to the quote, which in turn was connected with the theme of his own old age and his possible departure from life. All this was said harshly, and in places more than harshly, almost ferociously. Perhaps at some points in his speeches there were elements of play and calculation as constituent parts, but behind all this there was a true anxiety. Our note is that this is another admission that Stalin was sincere in his concern for the future and was not a power-hungry person. Back to the quote, which was not devoid of a tragic background. It was in connection with the danger of concessions fear, and capitulation that Stalin appealed to Lenin in those phrases that I already quoted in my entry at that time. 1953, with which we began quoting the memoirs of K. M. Simonov. Now, in essence, it was about himself, about Stalin, who may leave, and about those who may remain after him. But he did not talk about himself, Instead of himself, he talked about Lenin, about his fearlessness in the face of any circumstances. The main feature of Stalin's speech was that he did not consider it necessary to talk about courage or fear, determination or capitulationism. Everything that he said about these qualities, he connected concretely to two members of the Politburo who were sitting right there, in the room, behind his back, two meters from him, to people about whom I, for example, least expected to hear what Stalin said about them. First, with all this synodic of accusations and suspicions, accusations of instability, suspicions of cowardice, capitulationism, he fell upon Molotov. It was so unexpected that at first I could not believe my ears. I thought that I had misheard or not understood. But it turned out that this was exactly the case. It followed from Stalin's speech that the person most suspected by him of the capability of capitulationism, the person most dangerous in this sense for him that evening, at that plenum, was Molotov. Not any other person, but Molotov. He spoke about Molotov for a long time and mercilessly. He cited some examples, I did not remember, of the erroneous actions of Molotov, connected mainly with those periods when he, Stalin, was on vacation, and Molotov remained in his place and incorrectly resolved some issues that it had been necessary to resolve otherwise. Which, I don't remember, I don't remember, probably partly because Stalin spoke to an audience that was more aware of the political intricacies associated with these issues than I was. I didn't always understand what it was about. And secondly, probably because the accusations that he presented were somehow incomplete, unclear, and vague. In any case, in my perception, it seemed to be so. And this forgetfulness of the essence of the matter, arising from the unwillingness to understand the matter, is a characteristic feature of psychotrotskyism. It is not the content and not even the form of presenting information, not the meaning of what is said, that is remembered, but the emotional impression of what happened, conditioned by one's own raviousness first of all, and not events as such. On August the 4th, 2002, Radio Svoboda, in a program dedicated to the next anniversary of the massacre 
against the leaders of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee also recalled this plenum and the claims made by J.B. Stalin against V.M. Molotov. According to Radio Svoboda, among these claims was the accusation that following the lead of his wife, P.S. Zemchuzhina, V.M. Molotov in certain circumstances became a conductor of Zionist, i.e. inter-Nazi politics in the top leadership of the USSR. This message from Radio Svoboda, taking into account the fact that the intelligentsia of the USSR, for the most part, and K.M. Simonov, personally, were always very attentive to the Jewish question, suggests that in this case, we are dealing not at all with the forgetfulness of K.M. Simonov, but with his unwillingness to go into details. We return to the quote. I could simply not understand in what Molotov was to blame. I only understood that Stalin accused him of a number of actions in the post-war period, accusing him with anger of such intensity, which seemed to be connected with a direct danger for Molotov, with a direct threat, that those final conclusions, which, recalling the past, could have been expected from Stalin, would be made. In essence, the main content of his speech, the entire system of accusations of cowardice and capitulationism and calls for Leninist courage and inflexibility, Stalin concretely attached to the figure of Molotov. He was accused of all sins that should not have a place in the party when the time would come and Stalin would cease to be the head of the party. If J.V. Stalin had been mistaken in his description of V.M. Molotov, then, a few years later, Molotov would not have turned out to be a member of the anti-party group, consisting of Molotov, Malenkov, Kaganovich, and Shipilov, who joined them later, who allegedly opposed Khrushchev's policy of resuming the Leninist norms of party life, and wanted to restore the order in the party and the state that existed under Stalin. K.M. Simonov, however, does not recall this. If J.V. Stalin had been mistaken in his description of V.M. Molotov, then Khrushchev, Malenkov, and Marshal of the Soviet Union Zhukov, who joined them later, would have been part of the neo-Trotskyist anti-people group. Zhukov supported Khrushchev by providing the delivery of members of the Central Committee to the plenum by aircraft of the Air Force. And in the USSR, after the defeat of the neo-Trotskyist group, there would not have been stagnation, but real socialism, in all formal and informal indicators of the quality of life, surpassing the real capitalism of both the developed countries of Europe and America and the neo-colonial countries. Returning to the quote, For all the anger of Stalin, which sometimes even smacked of intemperance, what he said had the iron construction peculiar to him. The next part of his speech, dedicated to Mikoyan, had the same construction, shorter, but in some of its shades, perhaps even more angry and disrespectful. Our note about Mikoyan. In 1962, popular unrest broke out in the city of Novochirkask, Rostov region, caused by an increase in food prices in particular for meat, which immediately followed an increase in production rates at the Novocherkask electric locomotive plant. The rally in the square demanded a meeting with A.I. Mikoyan. Mikoyan at that time was secretly in the city and did not come out to meet the people. K.M. Simonov does not recall this either, although he might not have known about the whereabouts of A.I. Mikoyan at that time. Everything ended with the introduction of military units into the city for suppression and firing from machine guns. There were victims. After the rally was dispersed, the ringleaders were arrested, brought to trial, and shot. Alexander Ivanovich Lebed, as a teenager, was sitting in a tree during the rally. When the first machine gun fire was heard, other teenagers sitting on the same tree as Alexander a branch above and a branch below, fell dead from the tree. Alexander flew from the tree safe and sound, but he remembered this episode for the rest of his life. He remembered it also in August 1991, for which Muscovites 
should be grateful to him. As for the rise in prices in the post-Stalin era, prices in the national economy decrease as the range of production grows and needs are satisfied, as was accomplished under J.B. Stalin. In an anti-people economy, prices rise regardless of the dynamics of the range of production, since a rise in prices devalues wages, pensions, savings, and thereby puts everyone who lives by their own labor into a personal slavery dependence on the owners of the system. In accordance with this circumstance, in relation to Y.T. Gaidar and the Union of Right Forces as a whole, A.B. Chubais, V.S. Chernomirdin, A.Y. Livshitz, and many, many others, it is better to keep silent, rather than to say that they are the true spokesmen for the democratic idea. We return to the quote. There was a terrible silence in the hall. I didn't look back at my neighbors, but I did see the four members of the Politburo sitting behind Stalin at the podium from which he spoke. They all had petrified, tense, motionless faces. They did not know, just like us, where and when and at what point Stalin would stop, whether he would move on to someone else after Molotov and Mikoyan. They did not know what was yet to be heard about others, and maybe about themselves. The faces of Molotov and Mikoyan were white and dead. These faces remained the same white and dead once Stalin had finished and returned to sit down at the table. And they, first Molotov, then Mikoyan, went down one by one to the podium where Stalin had just stood. And there, Molotov for longer, Mikoyan shorter, tried to explain to Stalin their actions, deeds, to justify themselves, to tell him that they were never cowards nor capitulators and would not be afraid of new clashes with the capitalist camp and would not capitulate to it. And these attempts at self-justification by Molotov and Mikoyan are common civility. After the cruelty with which Stalin spoke of both of them, after the rage that sounded in many parts of his speech, both speakers appeared to be last word-taking defendants, who, although they deny all the guilt they are charged with, can hardly hope for a change in their fate, already decided by Stalin. A strange feeling that I then remembered, they entered, but it seemed to me that they were not the people whom I had seen many times, and quite close to myself but white masks worn on those faces, very similar to those faces themselves, and at the same time completely different, already inanimate. And this is a description of a zombie, which, by all appearances, corresponds to the structure of the psyche of both. The person himself is responsible for his own psyche structure, and not someone else. If both are zombies, then it is themselves who are to blame, not J.B. Stalin. I do not know if I have expressed myself accurately enough, but I had such a feeling, and I'm not exaggerating it in hindsight. I don't know why Stalin chose Molotov and Mikoyan as the two main objects of his mistrust in his final speech at the plenum of the Central Committee. The fact that he clearly wanted to compromise both of them, to belittle, to deprive the halo of some of the first historical figures to come after him was beyond doubt. He wanted to belittle them, especially Molotov, to nullify the halo that Molotov had. If the cult of his own personality was objectionable to Stalin, then why should he be pleased with the little cult of Molotov's personality, which flourished in the shadow of the personality cult of Stalin himself? Despite the fact that, in essence, in recent years he was largely removed from affairs, despite the fact that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was already headed by Vyshinsky, despite the fact that his wife was in prison. The name of Molotov's wife was Perl, born Perl Semyonova Karpovskaya, which means Pearl, and which became her party pseudonym, later turning into a family name, Zemchuzhina, origin Jewish. If Molotov was also under the heel, then she was imprisoned for the revealed anti-Bolshevik inter-Nazi influence which she exerted on her husband, a member of the Politburo 
of the Central Committee of the All Union Communist Party of Bolsheviks and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the USSR. Despite all this, to many, many people, and the wider the circle you take, the more of them there will be, the name of Molotov was called, or was recalled, directly after the name of Stalin. This is precisely what Stalin apparently did not want. He strove to make this understood and felt to everyone who had gathered at the plenum, to all old and young members and candidates of the Central Committee, to all old and new members of the executive bodies of the Central Committee who had yet to be elected. For some reason, he did not want Molotov after him, if something happened to him, to remain the first figure in the state and in the party, and his speech excluded such a possibility. One more thing. I don't remember, in the same speech, even before Molotov and Mikoyan were allowed to speak or after that, in another short speech that preceded the election of the executive bodies of the Central Committee, I'm afraid to even say that such a second speech happened, perhaps everything was said in the first speech. Stalin, standing at the podium and looking into the hall, spoke of his old age and the fact that he was not able to fulfill all the duties that were entrusted to him. He can continue to carry out his duties as chairman of the Council of Ministers. He can fulfill his duties, leading, as before, the meetings of the Politburo. But he is no longer able, as Secretary General, to preside over the meetings of the Central Committee. Therefore, he asks to be released from his last post, that his request be granted. In approximately such words, I convey it almost word for word, it was expressed. But it's not about the words themselves. Stalin, saying these words, looked into the hall, and behind him sat the Politburo, and standing at the table was Malenkov, who was holding the meeting. And on Malenkov's face, I saw a terrible expression, not of fright, not that he was frightened, but the expression that a person can have, clearer than all others, or clearer in any case than many others, was realized the mortal danger that hung over everyone's heads, and which others had not yet realized. You cannot agree to this request of Comrade Stalin. You cannot agree that he resigned from this one, the last of his three powers. You cannot. Malenkov's face, his gestures, his expressively raised hands, were a direct plea to all those present to immediately and decisively deny Stalin his request. Our note, Malenkov subsequently somehow overlooked, sensed something in the wrong way, and ended up in the anti-party group, together with Molotov. But it is possible that the Khrushchev neo-Trotskyists, knowing him well, did not take him into their team and preferred to get rid of him, enrolling him in the anti-party group of Molotov, Kaganovich, and Shipilov, who joined them later. Back to the quote. And then, having silenced out the words which came from behind Stalin's back, no, please stay, or something like that, the audience buzzed with the words, no, no, please stay, please take your request back. I don't presume to quote all the words of the shouts that sounded at that moment, but in general the audience understood something, and perhaps, for the most part, understood earlier than I did. At the first second, the first impression coming from the depths of the psyche, as statistics show, is, in the majority of cases, the closest to the objectively true. And all that followed was an attempt at self-justification, an attempt to justify the subsequent Khrushchevism and Brezhnevism, whose nomenclature was quite friendly towards K. M. Simonov. At the first second, it seemed to me that this was all natural. Stalin would preside over the Politburo, he would be chairman of the Council of Ministers, and the general secretary of the Central Committee would be someone else, as was the case under Lenin. That is, the well-intentioned poet-lyricist K. M. Simonov was, at heart, a supporter of the monarchical variant of ensuring the continuity of power. The leader prepares a new leader during his lifetime. But what I did not immediately understand what many immediately or almost immediately understood, and Malenkov, on whom, as presiding at that moment, 
lay the greatest part of the responsibility, and in which case the blame immediately understood was that Stalin was not going to give up the post of general secretary, that this is a test, probing the attitude to the question raised by him. How ready are they, sitting behind him in the presidium and sitting in front of him in the hall, to release him, Stalin, from the post of general secretary, because he is old, tired, can no longer bear this third duty. When the hall buzzed and shouted that Stalin should remain in the post of general secretary and lead the secretariat of the central committee, Malinkov's face, I remember this well, was the face of a man who had just passed a direct, real, mortal danger, because it was he who made the report on party congress and led practically the majority of sessions of the secretariat of the central committee, presiding at this meeting of the plenum. It was he who, in the event of a different solution to the question, was a natural candidate for the third post of Comrade Stalin, which the latter allegedly wanted to leave because of old age and fatigue. Our note. Unlike K. M. Simonov, Malenkov understood that this was not at all a certainty, and unlike the well-intentioned K. M. Simonov, the intraparty mafia, already then stood for the second monarchical variant. The conclave of associates itself nominates a new leader, proceeding from its own interests, at the same time perhaps deciding the question of when to bury the former leader. It was this that was manifested in Malenkov's reaction to the proposal of Stalin, which, if there had been Bolsheviks at the plenum and not serfs, would have made the intraparty mafia scenario impossible. Back to the quote. And if Stalin felt that there behind his back, or in front of his eyes, supporters of granting his request, I think the first who would have answered with his head would have been Malinkov. What it would have cost on the whole, it is difficult to imagine. In essence, this episode demonstrates that the initiative of J.V. Stalin to transfer his official powers as General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Party to a successor on the basis of the open nomination of candidates, their discussion at the plenum, and the election of a new General Secretary in a completely democratic way, was rejected carelessly and irresponsibly by the members of the Central Committee themselves, elected by the 19th Congress, who followed the lead of one of the leaders of the Apparatchiks, G. M. Malenkov, who chaired the plenum. This is an indisputable indicator that 13 years after the crowd elitarian 18th Congress, the crowd elitarian character of the party and members of its central committee was still preserved, although as far back as 1953, as noted by K. Simonov himself, he understood that the Congress and the plenum were convened in order to deal with business, and not for the participants to express their feelings for J.V. Stalin. That is, J.V. Stalin faced the same problem as Henry Ford, but unlike Henry Ford, at the state-wide level. But the vast majority of men, within a crowd elite society, want to stay put. They want to be led. They want to have everything done for them, and have no responsibility, and care. Therefore, in spite of the great mass of men, the difficulty is not to discover men to advance, but men who are willing to be advanced. The anti-Stalinists, whose foresight and intellectual power do not know the limits of serviceless resourcefulness, in their comments to this episode, like K. M. Simonov himself, assert that the members of the plenum presidium, who were sitting behind J. V. Stalin, behind the podium, and the members of the Central Committee, who were sitting in the hall, immediately guessed that the insidious J. V. Stalin was looking for another favourite of the party, who could eventually replace him, the earthly god, that is allegedly immortal, as leader of the party and head of the state, in order to start a new wave of unjustified repressions. In our opinion, everything is simpler. Of Bolsheviks in the hall, there was only one, J. V. Stalin. All the rest were cowardly, self-serving, and therefore serviceless careless 
frightened opportunists. Psychologically, they were slaves who, as a result of the great October Socialist Revolution, had formed a new, luxuriating stratum and held the high opinion of themselves as the true elite of Soviet society. This servile careless, but with claims to luxuriation, attitude towards the destiny of the motherland was not only shown by K. M. Simonov in describing the course of the plenum, but was clearly expressed in his personal attitude towards life in the post-Stalin era. Actually, it is in order that this statement of ours would not be perceived as unfounded that we have cited such an extensive quotation, so that those who watch this documentary could feel the conveyed by K. M. Simonov spirit of frightened party nomenclature servitude, which was openly manifested at that plenum. How J. V. Stalin reacted to the results of the plenum, he and God truly know. The members of the intra-party mafia, frightened during the first attempt at the illegitimate, in their opinion, transfer by J. V. Stalin of his official powers of General Secretary of the Central Committee, decided not to wait for the manifestations of the further initiative of J. V. Stalin and the party in this direction, and eliminated J. V. Stalin less than six months later, carrying out a palace coup. But as a result of such behavior of the plenum of each of its participants, as earlier, Bolshevism had left the hierarchy of the Russian Orthodox Biblical Church, so over the next decade, Bolshevism also left the organizational structures of the CPSU. Bolshevism truly left the organizational structures of the CPSU, but did not disappear from society, and it will not enter the organizational structures of any other party, the organizational principles of building of which impede the personal development of the individual. The transcript of the speech of J. V. Stalin at the October 1952 plenum of the Central Committee was not published either during his lifetime or after his death. Largely thanks to this, it was possible to maintain in society the myth of the dictatorial omnipotence of J. V. Stalin and his thirst for power for the sake of power. Some might think that J. V. Stalin himself did not want to publish his speech at the plenum. However, such an assumption implies that J. V. Stalin himself was a capitulator, a coward. That is, it is incompatible with the testimony of K. M. Simonov about what happened at the plenum. Much speaks to the fact that J. V. Stalin, throughout his career as party leader and head of the state, was heavily encircled by the apparatus mafia, which used his name and the slogans of socialism and communism as a cover in its self-serving activities. This situation continued to persist in 1952, and therefore, unexpected for the apparatus and the guardians within it, the speech at the plenum of the Central Committee, without a prepared text, was for J. V. Stalin almost the only opportunity to break through the informational blockade and convey to the rest of society, through the members and candidates for members, of the Central Committee, his true opinion, expressed directly and not in hints, or in the subtext of some kind of narrative. However, out of several dozen participants in the October 1952 plenum of the Central Committee, this, and what is more, 27 years later, was done only by K. M. Simonov, and even then, on his deathbed. Not wanting to leave for another world, with his sin on his soul, with the sin of hiding in his servile silence the truth, known to him, but concealed from the rest of society by the Mafia power. Furthermore, it should be understood that J. V. Stalin, at the October 1952 plenum of the Central Committee, really tried in his actions to rely on intra-party democracy, of the carrying out of which the participants in the plenum turned out to be incapable. And he did not only wish to express some thoughts on the assumption that the delegates would spread them throughout the Union. He needed an irreversible result in the life of the party itself, and not just for his words to be spread by delegates to all ends of the Union, where they would not entail any consequences, 
and would soon be forgotten under the influence of the current events. Therefore, a speech similar in content at one of the sessions of the 19th Congress, which, as it might seem, could solve the problem of disseminating information within society better as a consequence of the large number of participants in the Congress, was not suitable for Stalin's attempt to rely on real intra-party democracy. Suppression of the individual by the psychological effects of herdness in a larger Congress audience would have been stronger. The relatively small audience of the plenum was more suitable for awakening the political will of the people, and the informal, coming from the people, Bolshevik power of ordinary party members over the apparatus would finally emerge in the party. Unfortunately, this did not happen. Concerning the possibilities of J.V. Stalin's speeches in the press, however, there was a multi-level system of self-censorship of the crowd elite society, from direct administrative bans and direct mafia collusion of the periphery of the world behind the scenes, to pressure on the psyche of individuals by herd effects generated in society by the cult of Marxism and the personality cult of J.V. Stalin himself in which false ideas about the latter were formed. Stalin had no power over this multi-level system of censorship, and therefore was forced to adapt to it and bypass it and all the rest in his public activities. The difference in this adaptability to the system between J.V. Stalin and most other opportunists was that J.V. Stalin adapted to it, orienting on the strategy of transforming the life of the global civilization on the basis of the ideals of a previous community of free people, communism, while the majority of opportunists solved the selfish tasks of today and of the near future, as a minimum of their own survival in the system and as a maximum of joining the systemic elite on the basis of suppressing the lives of others. A society of a previous community made up of scoundrels. This is a preemptive characterization by V. O. Kluchevsky about the attempt to introduce into the organizational forms of socialism a multitude of carriers of crowd elite algorithmics of the psyche. It is useful to remember this whenever it concerns all kinds of abuse of power in the era of Stalinist Bolshevism. Stalin's lack of freedom in the opportunity to appear in print is also confirmed by the history of the termination of the publication of his collected works. From 1945 to 1951, the first 13 volumes were published, including books written by him, articles and texts of oral presentations up to 1934 inclusive. However, the preparation for the publication of the 14th to 16th volumes proceeded so slowly that it can be considered that in fact, the publication of the collected works of J.V. Stalin was terminated in 1951, even during the life of the allegedly omnipotent dictator. No public statements about the termination of proceedings on the publication of the works of the leader of the Soviet people were made during his lifetime. But, for the majority, there was simply an inexplicable delay in the release of the successive volumes of the subscription edition. Subscription editions of books were distributed by subscription in approximately the same way as newspapers and magazines are now distributed, with the only peculiarity that some of the subscription editions were delivered by mail to the customer at home, and some were distributed through a network of bookstores, which kept records of subscribers and their receipt of ordered publications. Accordingly, more than a year's delay in the release of successive volumes of the subscription edition of Stalin's works, could not have passed unnoticed and could not have but caused bewilderment among a fairly wide circle of people, as a minimum in all cities of the Soviet Union. The only explanation for this delay is that the proceedings on the publication were terminated by the method of purposeful delay and the introduction of incessant rectifications allegedly with the objectives of improvement. So, the question may arise, 
So the omnipotent dictator allegedly did not understand what was happening? Or was he going to live forever, and therefore postponed the release of the final edition of the collection of his revelations for a chronologically undefined later? J. V. Stalin, as an acting, conceptually powerful politician Bolshevik, interfered with the world behind the scenes, starting from the pre-war years. We have had too bitter an experience during the past 15 years. This is how the Documents on American Policy and Strategy, 1945-1950, NSC 20-1, dated August 18, 1948, characterizes the period after 1933, when the undivided power of the Trotskyist inter-Nazis in the USSR was interrupted by Stalin's Bolshevism. Extensive extracts from this directive of the U.S. National Security Council with the title U.S. Objectives with Respect to Russia have been published in the book by N. N. Yakovlev, CIA Target the USSR. After, at the end of the Great Patriotic War, the course of political life in the USSR had acquired a stable directionality on the irreversible liberation from the power of the internazism of the world behind the scenes. The world behind the scenes was forced to curb the USSR and solve the problem of minimizing the damage inflicted on itself by the activities of J.V. Stalin. The further publication of his works, which were supposed to have been included in the 14th to 16th volumes of the collected works, and were supposed to convey in a concentrated form to contemporaries and descendants the Stalinist vision of the course of events in 1934 to 1952, would also have been an obstacle to the implementation of the political scenarios of the world behind the scenes. The publication of the texts of Stalin's speeches, his articles and letters relating to these years, if it had been carried out in 1951 to 1953 within the composition of the 14th to 16th volumes of the collected works, could have significantly complicated and, in some ways, made impossible the neo-Trotskyist politics of the regime of N.S. Khrushchev. The newspaper Sankt Petersburgsky Viedemosti, dated 10th of March 1992, in the article the CIA had plans to assassinate the father of nations, with reference to the book of the American historian Burton Hirsch, The Old Boys, The American Elite, and the Origins of the CIA, informed that the plan of the assassination of J.V. Stalin was approved by the CIA director Alan Dulles in 1952. From this, it can be understood that the influence of J.V. Stalin on global politics was a very significant obstacle if an operation of this kind had been planned against an old man on December the 6th, 1952, J.V. Stalin turned 74 years old. The real date of birth, confirmed by an entry in the church books, is December the 6th, 1878. An old man who, taking into account the state of his health and lifestyle, had only a few years to live. Accordingly, Having made a decision on the elimination of J.V. Stalin, the world behind the scenes preemptively gave instructions to slow down the publication of his works, believing that with the establishment of a new regime in the USSR under its control, the crowd would not dare to demand the continuation of the publication of the collection of his works. And, being conceptually powerless, it would not be able to ensure the continuation of the Stalinist political course. And thus it happened. The set of volumes 14 to 16 and proof prints were destroyed with the coming two state power in the USSR of the new psycho Trotskyist anti Bolshevik regime of N.S. Khrushchev. And the question of continuing the publication of the works of J.V. Stalin, as far as is known, at the plenums and the congresses of the Capitulatory Party for the Self-Liquidation of Socialism did not rise, nor was it posed by the general public. In the USSR, only pro-bourgeois individualistic dissidents from the category of low worshippers of the West were active. Therefore, 
In reality, nothing speaks to the fact that in 1952, J.V. Stalin was able, bypassing the not subject to him hierarchically multi level self censorship of crowd elitism, directly tell society through the mass media of the USSR and the scientific press what he thought, including the giving of instructions to publish in newspapers and magazines his speech at the October plenum of the Central Committee or some other speech, the meaning of which was beyond the ability of society to adequately perceive. K. M. Simonov was one of the most widely erudite cultural figures of the USSR, in many cases an independent, not stereotypically thinking person. However, even with these qualities, he turned out to be psychologically unprepared to meaningfully perceive even that small part of socio-scientific truth that was expressed by J.B. Stalin in his speech at the plenum of the Central Committee. His example is one of the many indicators that there are statistically objective limits of perception of information by any audience, from one person to humanity as a whole, beyond which anyone who brings information to people has no possibility to go without the audience experiencing psychological breakdown of one kind or another depression, stupor, hysteria, directed at the audience itself or at others. The discussions that took place in the press on various questions in the post-war years, the letters received by the Central Committee and the government and personally addressed to him, provided a good idea of the world view and world understanding in society. What it could accept and understand and what it would reject without bothering itself with the rethinking of life and the said. This is well illustrated by the text of Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR. Judging by the reconstruction of the algorithmics of the collective psyche of Soviet society of that era, including on the basis of an analysis of the testimonies of contemporaries, certain censorship in the press and other media that was not subject to J.V. Stalin could have been escaped only by his particular written works and oral speeches matured in such a linguistic style that formally corresponded to the linguistic culture of Marxism prevailing in the USSR. They were not perceived by the apparatus mafia itself as a danger, and the world behind the scenes, even if it was able to understand the danger for its politics of what was said, simply did not have time to react through its periphery to these or those leaks of conceptually alien to society information. In such conditions, the continuity of conceptual power of Bolshevism was ensured. Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR is both a report by J.V. Stalin on the achievements during the period of his leadership of the party and the state, and a report on unresolved problems, as well as a testament to the Bolsheviks for the future. This collection of works was released as a separate edition in 1952. And although after the death of J.V. Stalin, his works were withdrawn from funds of public access in libraries, they ceased to be studied in school and university courses of sciences of a philosophical socio-scientific profile. Nonetheless, copies of a small brochure survived Khrushchevism and stagnation on the shelves of family libraries and came into demand by successors continuers belonging to the new generation of Bolsheviks. Stalin did not walk away into the past, he dissolved into the future, no matter how it may sadden many who are slaves at heart, even those with claims to slave ownership and luxuriation. Вот двигатели войны.